Good afternoon, friends. It's a real pleasure for us to have the this edition of the afternoons with an author. And our author today is uh, Mr. Ramesh Ender Singh, and we're discussing his excellent book called Turmoil in Punjab. And I'm very happy that we have with us as our lead discussant, Manraj Grewal Sharma. Uh, <clears throat> Manraj uh, is currently the resident editor of Indian Express at Chandigarh. But more than that, she's done decades of reporting on Punjab and has also covered this period of turmoil. Therefore, if there's somebody who has been an eyewitness uh, to the turmoil in Punjab and has looked at it from the lens of media, that is Manraj Krebal Sharma. And she's also done this explanation of this book in Indian Express. So I think we forwarded that to many of our colleagues here. So I'm so welcome to you, Manraj. Uh, and this uh, event is being uh, uh, broadcast, you know, also with the NDLI. NDLI is the National Digital Library of India which is based out of IIT Kharagpur, and they've got about 2,000 affiliated clubs. So many of their members would be joining us. This is the first time that the MIT School of Government in Pune, they'll also be joining us live on this event. Uh, great honor to welcome uh, Mr. Ramesh Inder Singh, my distinguished senior colleague and one of the, uh, one of the finest uh, civil servants in the country. You know, I was in Pune <laughs> last week, and uh, I was delivering the BG Deshmukh Memorial Lecture. And in the B.G. Deshmukh Memorial Lecture, B.G. Deshmukh, uh, in his book, A Cabinet Secretary Looks Back, he asks this question on whether a civil servant should write or should not write. And then, of course, he goes on to answer that a civil servant must write. And I think that tradition of a civil servant writing <clears throat> is absolutely important, especially in the context of contemporary history. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that understanding Punjab before, during, and after Blue Star, there could be no better book than Turmoil in Punjab by Ramesh Inder Singh. And there is a lot of credence about this in another book called In the Service of Free India, written by Mr. B.D. Pandey from the ICS, who happened to be the governor of Punjab during the turbulent times. And the blurb of the book by Mark Tilly says that it's a case of uh, missed opportunities, misplaced courage, military arrogance and criminality. It is also a story of many broken promises. But let me not go on and on because anyone who reads this book can go on and on and on. So let's get to the subject. Uh, let's get Manraj to start the conversation uh, with uh, with uh, Dr. Ramesh Ander Singh. Uh, we're very grateful to you. And friends, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions or comments, uh, do uh, put it on your chat box uh, in the YouTube channel and we'll try to respond to them. Uh, over to you, Manraji, uh, to to not really grill, but to uh, but to <laughs> ask uh, questions from uh, from Mr. Singh. Over to yeah. you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, first of oh. all, I you were the deputy commissioner of Amritsar during Operation Blue Star, right? I think you took over just a day or so before the operation. So. It, it took you very long to write this book. I mean, uh, what made you write it? And what about this huge gap between the operation and your book? You see, reason are twofold. I was only 35 years old when Operation Blue Star took place. And I was deputy commissioner in Amritsar. I had a long innings to go in service. And our uh, rules of conduct service rules do not permit you to write on these kind of sensitive issues. I re retired in 2009 as Chief Secretary of Punjab, then took over as uh, Chief Information Commissioner in RTI. So after finishing my inning with the government, I started writing. It took me three years. In the meantime, COVID came, and then the publishers took some time. And that is how it's uh, added up to 38 years from 1984, when the Blue Star took place. The second reason was that, uh, you know, I, I was scanning all the literature which has been published on this subject, and there is there, there are enormous number of uh, books, even uh, uh, you know, series of uh, uh, TV um, events, which have been made by various people, including some very prominent, uh, well-recognized authors and movie makers, including uh, like Sir Mark Tully. As Sanjeev Ji was reading his blurb, he was in fact the first one of the first to write <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Gandhi's last battle, uh, Amritsar. Then Kushwan Singh, Mr. 
Kuldeep Nayar, and and another maybe two dozen authors have come up. So I found that there were competing truths, or may I say, competing falsehoods, which were going around, narrating various versions of the events uh, which happened uh, during the two decades, starting from 1978 to about let's say 1956 in Punjab, and different versions were there. Everyone, according to his own perception, uh, wrote. Uh, some of these books, as for example, by Major General uh, later on Lieutenant General K. S. Barad, who was commanding the troops in Blue Star, uh, he has written a book called Blue Star. Also came up, and I found that though is a very honest uh, narrative of what happened, but it was a dressed-up narrative, you know, more to kind of present the facts from his uh, point of view. so i felt that there is a need to bring all these versions on record quote them where i am going to differ from them and give reasons why i am differing and why where the truth lies so this is the second reason that uh, this entire exercise took a bit time uh, to uh, complete and finally the book is out uh, now it's in the market and uh, last month it was launched and uh, this question may seem very wide but what led to operation blue star i mean what were the compulsions of the government did it not take into account the history and the importance of uh, the golden temple and the ramifications it could have i mean what must have compelled the government of the day to take this step i have explained and narrated the entire sequence of events which ultimately led to operation blue star uh, now it is fairly recognized and even in the military circles that operation blue star particularly the way it was conducted uh, was ill planned ill conceived and badly executed uh, even at that time let me uh, remind our viewers if if they have come across this or not the late president of india mr pranam mukherjee he was finance minister in mrs indira gandhi's uh, cabinet when the cabinet sub committee in may 1984 resolved to summon army in aid of civil authority in punjab pranam mukherjee has gone on record publicly as well as in his uh, autobiography that he he raised this issue that we should not do this uh, uh because there is a past history to golden temple and let's not repeat the same but he was obviously overruled uh today uh, we have number of army journals uh, who have gone on a record again to say so one of them being uh, general vk singh who was chief of army staff and now is a union minister in the cabinet of mr modi he has also in his autobiography Uh, admitted or rather asserted i would say not admitted asserted that blue star was uncalled for before him large number of generals uh, like lieutenant general sinha who was also governor of one of the north east states general nayar who was goc in western command uh, he succeeded G lieutenant general hoon who succeeded uh, lieutenant general sundar ji as goc of western command one after one have gone and recorded their opinion about that it was avoidable if i could uh, ask a question at this point of time you see you have uh, of course there are no heroes in this book uh, during that thing but you know the complete breakdown of machinery in the sense that the governor has written that you know the pmo was on its own uh, trip i mean the ib was not being consulted general sundar ji was uh, uh, was in direct touch so in many ways it is a classic case of governance failure a failure of governance and a failure of hierarchy which is something uh, totally against the norms that you know you and i have been trained in the civil service uh, what how would you like to you know react to this and do you think um, god forbid if such a situation were to happen again today do you think that we have learned some lessons from blue star because that's the most important thing So the two uh, parts to my question, first and the second. No, 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 Sanjeev, you are very right. I have analyzed in one chapter militancy beginning and end, how it rose, 
why it rose, why it flourished, and how it ended. Uh, you see, all those uh, factors which led to militancy exist even today. Let me be very honest and frank. Those social fault lines, the uh, exploitation of uh, polarization by political parties, you know, external factors from across the border, uh, identity issues. If you analyze all those, they still exist. They may be dormant. But one single reason why uh, Punjab deteriorated the way it did, it is my finding, apart from all these factors, I'm not minimizing these, is that it was not effectively governed. You know, Punjab needs a fair administration, good governance. And if it is not an effective administration, you see the history of Punjab, it has always uh, risen up, you know, including during the Mughal, Mughal time, uh, Afghans, earlier rulers. Whenever we had a just uh, effective ruler, Punjab was peaceful, like Maharaja Ranjit Singh take, for example, you know, it flourished. So it is very important to come back to your issue, you are very right. As a matter of fact, there's another chapter in the book called Collapse of Administrative Collapse. Now, violence in Punjab began in April 1978. Blue Star uh, was in June 1984. From 78 to 84, you see, violence was increasing every year, step by step. But it was ineffective and inappropriate handling both by the central government and state government and the political establishment, you know, that they allowed the violence to drift to a point when it was felt that now, look, it's not within our hands, only army can deal with this situation, you know. So uh, at that stage, at that time, it did seem to some that probably army is the only answer, you know. But that situation was allowed to drift. It, uh, there's another very big misconception about Punjab that it was a Khalistan movement. You know, uh, I'm sure you were going to ask me this question again, <laughs> either Manraj or you. It was not. It began in 1978 April as a clash between Rankaris who were perceived by the Sikhs to have committed sacrilege of their religion and a group of uh, Sikh followers of Akhand Kirtani Jata, Pindrawala, EISSF. It was a simple law and order problem which was not dealt with effectively and formally, you know. Uh, and between 1978 till almost 1982, if you see the number of uh, people killed in Punjab, they were all Nirankaris, their supporters, their followers, you know, including media, for example. Uh, a, a very iconic personality of media in Punjab, Lala Jakhtar Narayanji. You see, he was murdered. Uh, now, many people, you know, you can interpret it any way, but the main reason why he was murdered was, as it came out during interrogations later on, that he had appeared in as a witness in the Sikh Narankari clash, which ultimately the court ruled and acquitted the Narankari chief. So, you know, th these uh, religious... Uh, uh, sects and Jathebandis, they perceived him as pro Nrankari. So it was purely law and order situation which should have been dealt with effectively. Take, for example, Atwal's murder. Now, Atwal was uh, DIG, uh, Amritsar Ray, Jalanda. He had served as SSP. Why he was murdered? Because he was the SSP Amritsar when Pindrawala was arrested from Chomp Mehta. You know. And uh, that group perceived him as anti Pindrawala group and, and, and killed him. Now, what was our response? For two hours, mind you, two hours, his dead body lay outside Golden Temple. He, and he was clutching Prashad in his one hand, which he was to <clears throat> carry for his family. You see, he had come to pay respect. Now, what did we do? The SSP and the DC rang up the chief minister. Sir, what should we do? The chief minister rang up the prime minister. Prime Minister was in Rajasthan, you know. So PC Alexander, who was the principal secretary, started dialoguing between CM and PM. And ultimately, decision was taken that no police will not enter uh, the Sarai part of the complex, you know, uh, because it was 
it, it was the information was that these killers had escaped to those guest houses. Now, tell me in which country, you know, the district magistrate or the senior superintendent of police will rig up the CM and CM in turn the prime minister. A crime has happened. Your responses should be by a well-established procedure to enforce law. And I've said in my book, had the SSP and DC acted of their own, they would have been suspended. You know, because that is how the system works here in our country. And it is not then. Even today in many states you find instances where it is the law and order doesn't take its normal course of law and order. You see. It is twisted this way, bent this way, or, or influenced this way or that way. So to internalize this value system in Indian administrative system is extremely important that law, law violation is a crime and it must be dealt with as a crime, you know, and we should not look forward to left and right to see instructions or how you will be judged if you acted according to law. So uh, to, to sum up uh, what you asked me, it was a serious lapse of administrative law enforcement, failure of criminal justice system, which ultimately drifted into a movement which became an ethno-national movement by 1986, you know, and some segments within this movement raised the flag of Khalistan. So you Thanks, mentioned... Uh, sorry, Manraj, there you go. So you mentioned Bindra Wale. So he became this larger-than-life figure uh, who, who was the face of this ethno-national movement. And he, he, it was he who happened... Who, was successful in mobilizing a lot of people, especially in the countryside. So what led to the rise of Bindra Wale? Because he was just a, just a preacher. Uh, you are very right. Uh, Sant Jarnal Singh Bindra Wale was head of Damdabi Taksal, a very well-respected seminary, you know, which traces its history from the days of Shahid Baba Deep Singh and even Guru Gobind Singh. Uh, its primary... Uh, if you see, the history has been of preaching uh, Sikhism, good values of life, Sarbat Dapala, and they have been, you know, uh, that you Naam Japo, Vandike Chako, which means share with everyone. And Pindravala was also in, uh, he had grown in that fold. What happened was the Rankari Akali clash of April 1978, I have mentioned, in which his followers got killed. And they perceived that justice has not been delivered to them because the perceived murderers have been allowed to be acquitted by the district court and no appeal against their judgment was uh, uh, filed in the high court. So it became. In the meantime, you see, let me also be very blunt and clear on this. The political parties in Punjab, particularly in initial days, were not concerned about violence. Their concern was polarization because it suits both the major political parties uh, if there is a polarization of votes. Uh, if you see uh, the history of uh, STPC elections, certain segments within Congress voted Pindrawala, you know, to contest elections. Bhai Amrik Singh, his left-hand man, contested and lost to Akalis. So he was uh, being propped up as a competing force to Akalis to capture STPC during the earlier stages. When finally in, uh, in 1982, uh, Dharamyud Morcha was launched, he left the Congress, joined hands with the Kalis, you know, and, and that movement started. The point I'm making is that it suited the political parties so long as their respective political base bases remained tech or they, due to polarization, they expanded. It's only when the problem became so serious uh, that they realize that uh, enough is enough. Now we need to deal with violence. Yeah. Yes, Manmar. Yeah, Akali Dal also Akali Dal, one of the parties which with thick moorings, which could have intervened. Uh, they also kind of lost the plot during this period. Uh, what were they? I mean. Was it because they were themselves divided or was it because Bhindawala became this force and they kind of subsumed themselves in it? What were their compulsions? You're very right. Um, what you've said is very correct. Uh, uh, you know, 
Pandravala was perceived by the common man as a saint who preached a religion, who um, uh, lectured against uh, various vices like drugs and intoxication, you know. So he was put on a platform. Whereas Akalis were perceived as seekers of political power. So ultimately what happened was that Pindrawala started commanding a greater following in the rural areas, but particularly uh, in, among the peasants. Uh, then, and Akali Dal felt that they may not lose ground. Secondly, within Akali Dal, and that was, that's equally true of Congress, within Congress, there was a competition among the leaders, you know, to, to marginalize their opponents within the party and rise up. So they played a kind of politics of uh, fundamentalism, of promoting uh, individuals or concepts which serve their purpose. And, and, and this also helped. Media also, let me be, there is a chapter, independent chapter in the book on the fourth state, the role played by them in the entire period of two decades in Punjab. Military, military uh, uh, fourth state played a very, very important role in building up Sant Jamnayal Singh Pindrawal. Yeah. Uh, to the extent that uh, at one stage, Sant uh, Longowal, who was supposed to be the head of the uh, Kalidal Morcha, in which Pindrawal was, was just a part, uh, he accused the press openly uh, that you are shoving me you know, into a corner and all publicities, you don't come to me, you go to Sanjanal Singh Pandravala for interviews. And the situation arose by towards the end of 83 or mid of 83, when Longowal himself was afraid of uh, the militants. You know. And he has gone on record, he's made public statements, I don't know when my turn will come. And ultimately it did come. You know, As you know, after Jeet Longowal accord, he was assassinated. The point I'm making is that if you allow a situation to drift from 78 to 84, it's not days, weeks, months, it is years, you know, then situations uh, tend to get out of your hand. I think it it's should also be... about... Sorry. I think it's no, also a failure, as you mentioned, the failure of the district administration. I mean, a strong DM, a strong SSP. With a strong commissioner could have, you know, could have sort of rectified the situation, and we would not have had to use such harsh measures later. But again, you see, the other point which you made was, you know, the way the press in Punjab was completely divided. I mean, the the Hindi press, you know, polarization was happening, and along with that, there was another factor that was happening, and I think that factor you have ever too, but you have not mentioned it so clearly. That is the, the, the network of DAV colleges and the Hindu colleges on one side and the network of Khalsa colleges on the other. You know, so what was typically happening was, I, I, I think I was an exception that I studied in, in Khalsa College, Jalandhar, but uh, most people, I mean, if you were a Hindu, you went to the DAV college, if you were a Sikh, you went to the Khalsa college, and there were very few government colleges in, 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 in many districts of Punjab. So I think this also uh, helped to do things. But... One point which I have now is, you see that now that uh, the Punjab Kesri group have a Punjabi newspaper and the Jeet has a Hindi newspaper, over a period of time, Punjabi as the language of all of Punjab has been more or less accepted now. I mean, that polarization factor, the one factor which polarized Punjab in the first 10 years of the making of Punjab when, you know, the uh, when Punjabi had not been declared a language by the Hindus, at least that period is over. And the fact that today the Tribune, the Punjab History Group, and the Ajit Group, they are publishing editions in all the three languages. I think that itself is a is an important step, which, to my mind, uh, will lead to a greater balance. You know, because uh, I mean, I like, uh, in fact, I like Manraj also to comment on that. But of course, the main question is addressed to. Uh, to Mr. Ramesh in the same. Uh, Manaji, would you like to first respond to this? Or yes, uh, this, is, uh, this is quite interesting, the point you're making about uh, the whole bit about Punjabi, this, this divide between Punjabi and Hindi. So that has blurred a little. And it's become, even though there are people still 
there are there there are fears amongst punjabi sahityakars etc that the language will not survive because more and more people go to you know uh, schools where they you know even the villages tend to send their children to schools where they teach them english where you are given a rap on the knuckles if you speak punjabi or even hindi so there is this fear that over time people could stop speaking punjabi but i think when you look at the as you say the newspapers and when you also look at the folk uh, folk songs the uh, the pop music the movies so punjabi has become very mainstream and that divide that has uh, that has been if, it's if it's blurred if you call it if it's not completely over it's definitely blurred uh, uh i have uh, you know this book has two parts part 2 deals with historical background in which i have traced the history of how two congruent communities hindus and sikhs there in fact at uh, there uh, in the beginning there was no 1858 survey did not distinguish between hindu and sikh you see it is for the first time in 1881 you know that uh, this distinction or classification was made because sikhism as a distinct religion uh, founded by guru nanak dev ji emerged but its roots are in punjab which was and Uh, primarily a, a, a hindu society of that time of course with good number of muslims also uh, so there was no difference between the two communities they were congruent and if you if you if you read my book i trace how over a period of time you know uh, in fact at that time let me tell you the conflict was with hindus and sikhs on one side and muslims on the other side and and when christianity came to punjab that was another uh, fear which came in into punjab society and the exact word expression i have used it that th- th- there were floating religions because one thing british did which is uh, often not uh, mentioned by historians but i have said it in so many words is that it was for the first time in india that there was a complete freedom to preach your religion you know and that preaching was not by sword as as uh, uh, during moguls you know or during maharaja ranjit singh's time again it was a secular society but it was a self contained community religious communities there was no expansionism during british time the christian missionaries came they started preaching as a reaction to that there were hindu uh, reformist movements arya samaj brahmo samaj sanatan dharm so forth then there were sikh reformist movements like uh, uh, this uh, chief khalsa diwan and singh sabhas you see all these movements uh, started and there was such a competing dialogue going on in the british india and it suited the british because it divided the indians completely so in that division in fact uh, uh, please uh, uh, read the chapters uh, of historical background in the book i have narrated how arya samajists and the sikhs had joined hand in shuddhi movement to convert or reclaim the christians and muslims uh, into into uh, because the lines between hindu and sikhism though both sikhism sikhism is a distinct religion from the very first day it was founded by guru nanak dev ji but th- there was complete kind of uh, i would say um, comparative um, congruity between the two communities you see but later on there was a split uh, i won't go in this interview on this because i have narrated these facts uh, in in great detail in my book and the two communities started drifting you see uh, your life uh, rituals like birth rituals marriage rituals death rituals you know i, I mean initial days uh, these were common but over a period of time you know as 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 societies and and british as you know built on on ident- on, on uh, rather promoted identity politics you know there is a uh, seeds of the basis of religion they preferred serve in uh, government services certain uh, segments of society so those divisions came but 
pre partition hindus and sikhs were more or less together and let me tell you uh, master tara singh he had openly declared that pakistan over my head over the blood of the sikhs and the unionist party which ruled punjab till almost last uh, it it consisted of muslim sikhs and hindus uh, sir chotu ram of haryana uh, now haryana then punjab of course was a towering jat leader uh, sir sikandar hayat khan and they shoot away together uh, jinnah when he came to establish muslim league in punjab you know jinnah had to run and he called sir sikandar hayat khan as sardar sikandar singh you know he says he is not a muslim he is a sikh uh, he is listening to them that was at the political lofty political level the kind of unity among that uh, the communities the the agrarian bourgeois class had come together and that percolated down uh, because they were coming out with reformist movements like um, uh, debt relief and so on and so forth you know at that time congress did not join these groups and sardar patel again i have quoted in my book wrote that congress is adopting a wrong strategy in this in in particular in punjab so what i'm trying to say is that till 47 it was all right in 47 uh, when the british said ki would you like to join india or would you like to join pakistan six were you know spread out in in, in a very thin number there were hardly 6 or 7% of the joint punjab in terms of population so they couldn't possibly have had their own uh, independent country even if they wanted to or were given by the british jinnah pleaded with the with master tara singh and akali dal that you come and join pakistan we will give you a small independent federating independent unit in pakistan master tara singh opposed it till the end you know and in that sense joining of east punjab with india is a gift i would say of akali dal master tara singh who in unambiguous categorical terms align themselves with india otherwise mind you the boundaries of the princely states of punjab the sikh states like patiala and jeel they extended right up to narnol main mahendragarh which touches rajasthan and delhi you know so what i'm trying to say is that there, there was complete homogeneity congruity every there, there were no differences post independence what happened a uh, language issue came up this language issue was also a critical tool in the hands of certain leaders uh, to you know uh, divide uh, the communities i would say in punjab the language spoken language was punjabi and it is on record from the gazetteers and the surveys that almost 81% of the punjabis and that included the muslims also were punjabi speaking but overnight after partition you see there was a switch over of that language uh, at home they spoke everybody spoke punjabi but in official record you know they mentioned it and then the punjabi subah agitation came up because the central government adopted as a policy linguistic basis for formation of indian states state after state was formed in the country but in punjab it was not formed on the basis of punjab punjabi so the agitation started agitation continued lingered for many years it further divided the communities polarized the communities and it suited everyone because you know akali dal has its base among the sikhs and congress had its base among the hindus urban hindus you know so it suited everyone a some kind of a formula was worked out uh, that let's have uh, first language in the punjabi speaking region and first uh, as punjabi in the hindi re- region have hindi as it but it was also not accepted such a formula was there then a revised such a formula came in another form ultimately you know uh, punjab was divided in 66 post 65 war and one reason which led to that division was uh, the role played by punjabis in 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 the victory of 1965 battle against pakistan i have detailed all these facts and i have quoted sources um, you know published sources to support my contention the point i am making is uh, same punjab post 
adopted a Punjabi policy that in government schools, Punjabi will be first language. In private schools, the children have the option. They can opt Hindi as um, first language or Punjabi as first language as they like. BJP and Akali Dal joined hands to form government. And over the, it was within a matter of, I would say, months, you know, that, that the past uh, tension disappeared and Punjab became absolutely normal. Uh, much later, um, uh, Tota Singh was uh, education minister during Badu's regime. They brought in English, uh, as uh, Manraj rightly mentioned, that English is important language. So they brought in English from the schools, primary schools. And now all over Punjab, you know, Punjabi is very well accepted because it is your mother tongue. You know, it was only, I would say, artificially an official record disowned. And to answer the point you uh, touched, Sanjeev, in Punjab, educational institutions were never uh, a dividing factor. In fact, whether Hindu or Sikh, they chose that school or college on the basis of its reputation for excellence. You know, if you see Khalsa College Amritsar, you will find a large number of uh, non-Sikhs went to that college. If you see DAV College Jalandhar, large number of Sikhs went to DAV College Jalandhar. You know, because it, what mattered with parents was where these wards will get the best education, you know, uh, that that is what prevailed. And so far as uh, newspapers are concerned, you mentioned, because Hindi did not have a base in Punjab, it, 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 the, a commercial, commercially a paper was not viable. Uh, Hinsamachar group, uh, Ajit and others, in fact, the main newspapers of Punjab after partition were Urdu, not even Punjabi. You see, then, I mean, I, your parents, my parents, if you recollect, they all are wrote and they, they spoke in Punjabi, you know, but wrote letters, etc., exchanging all in Urdu. So, it, uh, after 47, all these newspapers, their main circulation was of the uh, Urdu papers. Later on, Punjabi newspapers came. The first Hindi newspaper by Hind Samachar group was around 1966. Because there were no readership of Hindi, you see. Hindi had no base in Devnagari script, had no base in Punjab. But now you are right, uh, you know, every newspaper is enlarging its base and they have their Hindi editions, whether Tribune or Ajit group or Hind Samajar group. Let me assure you that language is not dividing the Punjabis today. Uh, they have realized the mistake they committed uh, in the, uh, uh, prior to 66. They have corrected that people are living together peacefully. There is no division. You know. These are artificially created by either certain movements or by certain political leaders or because of the vote bank. Otherwise, there is a total cohesion. <clears throat> you know, uh, after an accession of uh, Sikh Empire, uh, Maharaja and these things by the British, I remember the Lieutenant Governor of uh, Punjab going on record, and I have quoted him uh, in my book, that there, there shall never be peace in Punjab so long as its population is allowed to wield weapons. Because Punjabis, why, why he made that statement was, from 7th century onwards, good Lord, they faced invasions, you know. So, one after the other, the invaders came, and prior to that, even Porus, for example, you know, the, the, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, when he came. So all these evasions over centuries and centuries have internalized certain values in uh, Punjabi people. And one of them is that they take to violence very easily. Uh, it doesn't agitate them as much as, let's say, it may agitate Gujaratis you know, or some other, other others. Uh, so violence, uh, uh, if you see even the post-independence movements, the first movement was Lal Kurti uh, leftist movement, you know, uh, in Pepsi. Army had to be called to control them. Then again, there were dacoits, like we are talking of today, these gangsters, you see. There were, there were dacoits in Punjab, which had to be eliminated again by the police. Then there was an exilite movement. You and I know from Bengal, our parent Carter, how difficult it was for Bengal police to, you know, deal with that situation. When I went to Bengal in 1975 and visited some of these police stations, I found that there was a guard 
with a uh, uh, iron steel chain which was tied to his belt and to his gun and there was another guard guarding the guard you know in the traffic crossings you would have remembered you know yes, there was yes. a traffic man in the center and in the four corners there were you see, four people guarding him but in punjab they eliminated the uh, well one can challenge and contest how they did uh, their methodology but the fact is that within a matter of months and year uh, nationalism was wiped out of punjab so punjab deserves and demands good governance effective governance just governance if you can give that to punjab punjabis are enterprising they are concerned with their own you know uh, life in, in celebrating life i would say rather than these other issues the problem arises when the various social fault lines are allowed to be allowed to to prop up you know by various political forces or interested vested groups and uh, we commit mistakes so we also you also spoke about the foreign hand so Ji. was this precipitated by the foreign hand you were because you mentioned the a, a chapter in which you mentioned the siege of the grace uh, this the Mecca. yeah and mosque of mecca yeah yeah yes you are very right you see firstly let me make it very clear that no foreign power can create a situation in your country if you yourselves are not willing to uh, uh, to let it be created punjab problem was essentially a creation of our own self you know but your inimical for foreign powers will always step in to exploit that situation we did it in bangladesh you know mukti, mukti bahani they tried to pay us back in punjab the mistake where the militants uh, failed to realize in their early stage of uh, violence is that pakistan is not sincere to them the intent of pakistan was never to create khalistan you know it is extremely important to note this and very often misunderstood because it suits politicians they also say so that they were promoting a khalistan movement the terrorist groups when they published the the map of khalistan it showed lahore nankana sahib as part of the khalistan jual hak went into a rage he said what kind of a, the, the, these guys who were giving them you know the bank rolling their movement because and, and no sick militant can ever disown lahore or guru nanak dev ji you know you are familiar with the our daily uh, ardas which we perform yes, at homes yes. and gurdwaras han ji jinna to sanu vichhodya gaya hai unna de khulle darshan dadar da matlab our historical places of which we have been deprived oh god give us the free movement and uh, you know uh, chance to pay our uh, respect at those places so the objective of pakistan was to create communal divide in punjab trigger a cross migration of hindus from punjab to other parts of india and of the sikhs from other parts of india to punjab that is the reason if you see you see in afghanistan for example the mujahideens got tanks they got missiles they got uh, shoulder fired um, rockets in punjab what was the nature of the weapons supplied to the militants initial stages is these were 12 bore and uh, uh, pistol and uh, revolver at second stage uh, these light automatic weapons came like ak47 never did pakistan arm the militants with weapons which could take on army and indian militants uh, always uh, you know killed innocent individuals you can't achieve khalistan by killing a b c d on the road you know the punjabi militants the sikh militants never never took on our indian army not even one instance and they were in fact told by the pakistanis that please don't meddle with army Uh, because it would eliminate the entire movement within a matter of months so their their main objective was to create kind of social chaos chaos you know create violence uh, trigger cross um, state uh, migration uh, let the two communities come to blow with each other that was their objective to destabilize india and they did so but when they realized that uh, 
in fact, uh, coming back to Makkah, uh, the holy mosque, mosque of Makkah in Saudi Arabia, two years before Blue Star was seized by Islamic militants. Uh, like Golden Temple had fortifications, the same way the Holy Mosque of Mecca was kind of fortified by these uh, uh, religious Islamists. They were against the Saudi rulers. They felt that they are not doing enough for promotion of Islam. So there was a revolt. Now the Saudis were faced with the situation uh, to kind of clear them of the mosque and capture the mosque back. Their own uh, armed people, when they went, some of them revolted. They took the same kind of weapons which were later on used in uh, Blue Star. They used tanks, they used uh, APCs, armed personnel carriers, you know. But assaults failed and it invited reaction. They grafted the, the ulema or the holy uh, people of Islam to give call against the uh, people who had occupied the mosque. That also failed. Ultimately, it is the Pakistani commandos it was French commandos and American commandos, you know, who were uh, uh, by the Saudis requisitioned or sought their help. And they, with Pakistanis in the lead, cleared the mosque with the same kind of devastation uh, which happened uh, in Golden Temple. Now, after that, there was a movement, an armed movement in Saudi Arabia. There were also revolts and desertions in uh, Saudi Arabia. The point I made in this book is that ISI and Pakistan were, because of their this experience, they knew the importance of, uh, of, of, of handling a religious place. Like uh, Makkah Mosque is the holiest of holy for Islam, Golden Temple is the holiest of holy for the Sikhs. So what they did was, since the Nelson Pindramala was living in Guru Nanak Nivas, they triggered a clash there. Uh, my information is, you know, it, uh, let me be again very clear, these uh, uh, intelligence moves and operations, they are so clandestine that if you ask me, give me evidence, it's very difficult to give you, okay, here is the paper where I, as I had planned this. But information is this, which, which I have verified, that this clash in Guru Nanak Nivas between followers of Jansanda, uh, Pandravala and his opposing group, Babur Khalsa, was triggered by ISI with the intent to create a insecurity in the Pindrawala group and push him uh, and shift to Akal Takht. Now, Akal Takht is not a residential place. You see. It is the seat of uh, Miri Piri, you know, Golden Temple and Akal Takht. But there are one or two rooms at, at the back of Akal Takht, you know, which are used uh, by Granthis and others. So uh, they shifted it because Pakistan knew that if Akal Takht is, uh, uh, is, the, is the residence of Pindrabala, it will be that much more difficult for the forces to, to kind of remove him from there. You know. It gave Pindrabala security, it created a problem for Indian security to that extent. And ultimately, we know that is what happened. You know. uh, Akal Takht virtually was, um, it, 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 it was blown. You know. uh, and, and, and that triggered again the six sentiment, uh, anti-government uh, feelings and uh, promoted the national movement. So Pakistan always uh, bankrolled uh, the, the Khalistani movement. Uh, people like uh, uh, Jagjit Singh Chauhan, uh, Tillo in America, you know, they were funded by, you know, there is enough evidence. They have come back and admitted it. As a matter of fact, after the... Khalistan movement, this uh, ethno national movement was over. All of them came one by one back to India. They were put to trial and then released after uh, completing the formalities. Now, these people have gone on record to say that they were fooled by the Pakistanis, you know, because Pakistan was never sincere to the movement. Uh, they thought that Pakistan is helping them for Khalistan. Actually, Pakistan was using them to create trouble in India. That was their intent. And ultimately, when Pakistan realized this, that the uh, Khalistan movement is not picking up or it has petered off, in 89, when Rajiv Gandhi went to Lahore for a SARC uh, meeting, Benazir Bhutto had taken over as the Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan. Rajiv uh, uh, you know, sought his help to tackle militancy in Punjab. And Benazir Bhutto, and he reached an uh, agreement, understanding, 
a kind of quid pro quo. Bezir asked Rajiv that you withdraw the Indian forces from the Saichin uh, glacier heights, you know, which were captured by us, uh, and and I will stop um, all support to the militants. Uh, my, uh, I have mentioned all these facts in detail. Ultimately, uh, some information did come from Pakistan, and that was used by us to eliminate the uh, militants. And Benazir Pukto accused uh, Rajiv Gandhi later on that he backed out from his promise to pull the forces uh, from Saichin Glacier. Uh, there are a few American authors who have written books on ISI in Pakistan. Uh, where they have uh, used the kind of expressions that Pakistan betrayed the six militancy, you know, by, by this, and it led to their elimination. But this instance of Bedezid Bhutto is probably the single instance uh, where Pakistan may have rendered some help to India. Otherwise, they continue to still, you know, um, foment trouble in India. And they, when they, they did help uh, India and Punjab, they switched over to Kashmir. So it was not as if there was, this was the end of uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, efforts to create trouble in India. They merely changed their geographical field of operation from Punjab to JNK. And see, how do you view uh, the election of Simranjit Singh Man? You've mentioned him in a book. You've mentioned it at one place that uh, the first time you met Bindra Wale was through Simranjit Singh Man. That's right. Uh, yeah, so Not tell us a little true. bit about that, about yeah, what you, was. I was in 1978. Uh, uh, I came from Bengal to Punjab, and my first posting in uh, Punjab was as additional deputy commissioner Amritsar. My immediate neighbor in the government colony was the uh, senior superintendent of police on one side and deputy commissioner on the other. And Sir Samranjit Singh Mahan at that time was the SSP. So one day I got a call from him that Sir Janel Singh Pindrala is with him and he wants to see you uh, regarding some work. I said, most welcome. So he just walked across because there was only a barbed wire between his house and my house. And he came, his, his main demand at that time was that uh, ADC Saab to see license in them then. They do not issue licenses. So please be liberal and give my boys... Uh, uh, arm licenses liberally. So I told him, look, there is a procedure you have to follow. But anyway, that's a separate story. Uh, Sir Simranjit Singh Man, uh, you know, uh, I again could say, though he he's, he's very clear in his uh, expressions that he still stands for Khalistan. Uh, but when he resigned from service in protest against New Star, uh, and was released, and he contested election from Tarantar parliamentary constituency and won by a huge margin, you know. Uh, at that time, he wrote a letter to Chief Justice of India owing allegiance to the Constitution of India. Uh, then, again, in the election, he would have sworn, you know, allegiance to the Constitution of India. But later on, he again backtracked on that issue and... Uh, I would say he became, during those militancy days, the democratic front of uh, militants. Because one thing which is very clear, that Simranjit Singh Mahan has never uh, promoted or preached violence. You know, his demand for Khalistan is through a democratic means. But that apart, uh, in this election also, he would have again sworn in, and now he has taken oath in parliament, which, which is available on uh, YouTube. He has again sworn by the Constitution of India. So there is a kind of a dichotomy in his uh, approach. On one side, he is uh, taking oath uh, clearly, you know, uh, 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 under the Constitution, owing allegiance to Constitution and to stand for the unity and integrity of India. But outside, he comes out and gives all kind of interviews. Why he won? No, that is the question which Sindhiv asked in the beginning. And uh, I think Manarachi has answered that. Uh, substantially. See, what happened was, one, that the voting percentage was very low. The enthusiasm which the state assembly had, uh, uh, you know, got from the people, that was missing. So most of the youth which voted for AAP and MAS uh, in the assembly, 
they didn't come forward to vote for up why they didn't is a matter of uh, you know investigation either maybe they were not satisfied during that two and a half three months or whatever it is the second reason is that uh, simran jit singh man uh, was uh, supported by certain uh, you know popular figures like uh, muse wala singh uh, which manraj ji has mentioned and before him uh, this deep siddhu who if you recall hoisted the Uh, the, the, the flag at uh, gold uh, at, at red fort during the farmers agitation he died in an accident he had also given a call during his life before his death assembly day selection days to vote for simran jit singh man so those elements you know uh, uh, sympathy vote of muse wala because he was murdered only days before the polling third reason to my mind is division of votes because you had aap you had simranjit singh mans akali dal you have akali dal badal you had bjp uh, you had congress and you had many independents normally in in in, in parliament election in punjab it used to be that there was a seat sharing between bjp and akalis you know and here you were BJ, you had bjp akalis as well as uh, akali dal of uh, simranjit singh man so votes got divided low polling division of votes sympathy in favor of uh, man due to death of musewala and his call all these factors have led to his uh, uh, that's uh, very narrow margin victory uh, whether he is able to now deliver or not is to be seen well we are uh, about to come to the close of our program because everything <laughs> there's a time limit to everything Uh, there have been many comments. The comments have been that it's very informative, it's very enlightening. There have been no specific questions as such. But before we close, I would like to bring in the aspect of broken promises. You know, uh, at various points of time, the Congress leadership, including the then Prime Minister, uh, made several promises. Those promises were made by Mr. Rajiv Gandhi also, but those promises were not kept. So that is a festering sort of a problem. so would you like to talk about and that's something which uh, which uh, mr pandey also mentioned that you know sometimes politicians make promises uh, which they do not intend to keep so do you think here was a case of not wanting to keep those promises or those promises not being kept because of elections or whatever other reasons uh, sanjeev ji you are absolutely hit the nail in the head Um, uh, in in uh, giving this observation, so far as Punjab problem is concerned, you see, eighty-one uh, uh, Akali Dal raised forty-five demands. They reduced it ultimately to ten <clears throat> demands. And what were they? Uh, uh, name uh, the 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 train after Golden Temple, uh, ban tobacco and uh, meat in the walled city of Amritsar. You know. Uh, declare punjabi uh, 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 as as the accepted language in punjabi speaking area these kind of demands which i would say are absolutely innocuous you know and it should take a half an hour to sit across the table and sort these out you see but what happened 26 meetings i'm repeating 26 meetings took place between akalis and the congress central leadership and in these meeting thrice prime minister indira gandhi you know chaired the meetings rajiv gandhi attended it and it was drifting and bd pandey the governor has mentioned that it was more of a camouflage you know time gaining drifting by the central leadership which resulted to the postponement of elections on 25th may 1984 mrs gandhi summoned general vaidya the then chief of army staff and mandated him conveyed him the cabinet subcommittee's uh, decision which was taken in mid may that move the army 26 may the day after when they had been mandated akali leaders were called to delhi uh, and uh, late gurcharan singh toda has filed a affidavit on oath in delhi high court to this effect you know during his lifetime he filed this uh, that negotiations were held with us in the forenoon of 26 by four union ministers cabinet minister and principal secretary to prime minister everything was ag- agreed and this had been agreed thrice before with swaran singh with captain amrinder singh 
and Harkishan Singh Sarji, the communist leader. They all gone on record. You see, the thrice agreement was reached and the central government backed out. Now, on 26th, the four union ministers agreed in the forenoon that yes, this is agreeable. We'll go and get the green chip uh, from the Honorable Prime Minister. Uh, you wait here. In the evening, they come back, they said, sorry, uh, uh, these are not acceptable to the government of India. So, negotiations were used as a tool, I would say, uh, either because of political interests, I can only see this as the reasonable, rational uh, explanation. Coming to Rajiv Gandhi, what you said, take, for example, Anandapur Sahab resolution. You know, this was a resolution adopted by a Kali Dal, uh, which uh, is primarily deals with the federalism, uh, giving more rights to the states. Now, similar resolutions uh, in a different language were called, were passed by the communist parties, <laughs> Jyoti Basu, CKM, but in, in Tamil Nadu by Anna DMK, DMK and Anna DMK. In Punjab, the same Anandpur Sahib resolution, uh, you know, was whipped up as anti-national, as, you know, separatist. <clears throat> and at one stage, the Congress leadership even refused to negotiate or talk about it. So conflict was built, you know. From the date of passing of the resolution till Rajiv Longoval, Longoval Accord was signed by Rajiv Gandhi, you know, 86 post blue star. And it was agreed, let's refer this Anandpur Sahib resolution to Sarkaria Commission for adjudication. And whatever they decide, the Sarkaria Commission will be acceptable. Now you tell me, why couldn't it be agreed five years before? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely, so, so that so. is the point I'm making. Uh, you yes. see, the, the sir, fundamental issue is that nation-building strategy by itself should not be divisive. You know, Absolutely. Just because you have political interests, you want votes, you want to polarize them, you know, it will not lead to unity. In the name of unity, if you create a division, you know, it will boomerang at some stage or the other. Absolutely, sir. I think you've hit the, I mean, you, you've spoken from the heart and, you know, you have bring, you brought in uh, anecdotal evidence, you brought in empirical evidence, you brought in historical evidence. On the whole, it's one of the finest books that we can read on the contemporary history of Punjab. Before we close, I'll give uh, two minutes or one and a half minute to Manraj. And I'd like to thank all our viewers. Uh, if there are some questions, you can please send them on the email and we'll request uh, Mr. Ramesh and the Singh to, to respond to them. Thank you very much, sir. My, request to, my request to Manraj to close the conversation. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you much, so sir. Much. Not at all. Thank you so much, both of you. And lovely session. And uh, as you said it, it's a fantastic book. It's something that I've been getting my 10-year-old to read because I, I think if you want to understand Punjab, in fact, lately people have even begun, uh, diplomats asking me, what is Punjabiyat? So I think all of it, if you read this book, you'll get it. The history of Punjab, the turmoil, the aftermath, and the return to peace. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And we look forward to the Punjabi edition of this book. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. And thank you to all our viewers. Thank you, NDLI.